Uh, thank you, Rod. Um, good morning, Congress. Um, I know that I'm speaking on behalf of our President, Andrea, and obviously myself, that in this job, yes, there are trying moments, there are difficulties, we're busy, but the beauty of the jobs is that you get to go all over these islands. And sometimes words like inspirational can be overstated. Uh, but in these jobs, we literally do see week in, week out, inspirational nurses. But last September, I had the absolute privilege uh, to be in Derry, London, Derry, uh, at the time of the launch uh, of the book that you're going to hear about. And it was one of those seminal moments where everybody um, was, everybody, um, was um, affected by it uh, because it was just so emotional. And that's why we thought um, it was important to have this event uh, today. Now, just very briefly, because there are people here that uh, weren't even born when so much of this was happening. The Troubles erupted in 1969 and were a devastating time for people in Northern Ireland. And it was the most protracted period of civil unrest and conflict experienced, not just in the United Kingdom, but also in Europe. The violence lasted for more than three decades and continued up until the Good Friday Agreement in April 1998. Despite this agreed settlement, a number of terrorist, terrorist incidents continued, such as the terrible Ormar bombing in August 1998. To put this into context, the population of Northern Ireland throughout those decades was between 1.4 and 1.5 million people. 3,725 people were killed. 47,000 people in that small population were injured. By 2008, there were an ex estimated 6,404 sh uh, paramilitary shootings and beatings. There were 16,209 bombings and 36,923 shootings. These are immense statistics. The equivalent death rate, if it had implied to the rest of the United Kingdom would have been 100,000 people um, who were killed. So think of what our colleagues and the people of Northern Ireland have had to cope with. Now, during this period, nurses, midwives, health visitors, nursing assistants, healthcare assistants played a key role in caring for those who were injured by the bomb or the bullet, both in hospitals, both in the community, and often putting themselves and their families at risk and many experienced family members that were injured and killed. Just pause on it for a moment. You know, particularly you know, for young, newly qualified nurses, seeing people coming in with these horrific injuries, truly shocking. And throughout it, the resilience of health service staff was truly, truly astonishing. Now, despite all of that, the role played by nurses during the Troubles was never documented until the History of Nursing Network in Northern Ireland, led by Margaret Graham, decided to take on the mammoth task of pulling these stories together. This work led to the publication of the book Nurses' Voices from the Northern Ireland Troubles, which you're going to hear about. But before that, I just want to mention some of them, someone that some of you will know, but I'm sure some of you will not. The book would not have been possible had it not been for Dr. Mona Gray. She's widely regarded as the most influential nurse in the history of Northern Ireland. Mona's legacy is there for nursing in Northern Ireland is unparalleled. She was the first ever salaried secretary of the Royal College of Nursing and under her leadership, 
the RCN secured better educational uh, opportunities and better salaries for nurses in Northern Ireland, and she truly enhanced the profession. Mona went on to become the Chief Nursing Officer for Northern Ireland, and even in her retirement, she lived to be nearly 100, she continued to exert considerable influence. And when I was appointed, she wrote to me in her late 90s and asked to see me, and I loved going over to see her every time I went to Northern Ireland. Her commitment to nursing was so unwavering that she bequeathed a considerable sum of money to help facilitate the writing and publication and launch of the book. And we are in debt to her for her generosity. As long as there is a Royal College of Nursing, the name of Mona Gray must continue because she truly was an inspiring nurse. Now, it's my immense pleasure to hand over to Margaret Graham to hear more from her about Nurses' Voices from the troubles in Northern Ireland. Margaret. Peter. Good morning, Madam President, Dr. Carter, distinguished guests and delegates. As lead for the History of Nursing Network in Northern Ireland, I wish to thank Congress for the opportunity of sharing with you the outcome of a major project which our committee commenced in the spring of 2011 and completed last September with the launch of a book entitled Nurses' Voices from the Troubles, a collection of narratives gathered from nurses across Northern Ireland who had worked in any branch of nursing and at any time across the province during more than three decades of civil con conflict. Our book was launched last September, as Peter has said, from the Guildhall in Derry, Londonderry, during their year as UK City of Culture. And for our small team of eight retired nurses, we considered this to be quite a remarkable achievement. I am particularly pleased to be here today as Miss Robb, who was matron of the Royal Victoria Hospital at the outbreak of the Troubles, my matron, fondly recalls the practical support she and others received from the College and Congress. I am joined on the platform by fellow committee member John Hall, who will be a familiar face to many, as he's been a lifetime supporter of the College and been a frequent participant at Congress. John was honoured for his services to nursing in 2007 and received the Award of Merit in 1998. Professor Jean Orr, also honoured for her services to nursing, is on the platform. Jean was a major player in the editing and overall compilation of the book. Our committee were delighted when Jean volunteered to read and edit the stories, and her support in getting the book put together has been immense. You will hear from two nursing contributors shortly, Jean and Attracta. Dr. Carter has shared some of the statistical data gathered throughout the years of conflict. Nurses saw the human face behind those statistics of those killed and injured. It is difficult to comprehend the impact that the violence has had on our small community. Many nurses who cared for the dying silently remember the events and dates which they played a part in. So why gather narratives? The History of Nursing Network has for many years been gathering oral histories from retired nurses, so it seemed natural to begin to capture stories from nurses who had worked in more recent times throughout the Troubles, which played such an influential part of our recent professional and social history, impacting on a generation of nurses. As a committee, we felt it was important to have these experiences not only documented, but to be accessible in the form of a book as a lasting testimony to the profession as we knew the awful horrors that many had been consistently exposed to. But where to start? Because the plan was to invite nurses to write their personal stories, of major concern was how to assess their support. Would they want to engage? And if so, how could we contact them, given that many were retired? To launch the project and to test the response, we began with an event in Belfast, using the expert advice of a well-respected local author and journalist, Alf McCreary, who had published a number of troubles-related books, including one dedicated to Mary Wilson, a student nurse killed in the Enniskillen Poppy Day bomb. It was full house for this event. Nurses wanted to tell their story, and so we began 
using the RCN board and branch networks, notices in RCN bulletin, our local website, local newspapers, and through word of mouth, we spread the word that we were gathering narratives. Workshops were held at a number of locations across the province, attracting many nurses who were prepared to come and listen and recount their own experiences. In total, we received over 100 stories from over 60 contributors. The accounts gathered in this book are therefore a small representative collection, but show the impact that the troubles had on the professional and personal life of the nursing workforce. Every story told can be matched by hundreds untold. Many nurses have so many unbelievable experiences, some hardly knew where to begin. On many occasions, nurses approached committee members with tears in their eyes saying they would like to tell their story, but were emotionally unable because the memories were either too painful to recount or remain mentally blocked. Many still have flashbacks, especially when particular events are noted by the media. We had contributors who asked to remain non anonymous because of fear. As we traveled around, certain themes recurred. Firstly, the overwhelming support for the project. As a committee, we were totally taken aback at how frequently we heard the phrase, nobody has ever asked us what it was like. Tell our story, it needs to be told. Secure in their groups, nurses spoke freely, sometimes for the first time. All of the events they had been involved in held a great poignancy. You will recognise many of the names. Bloody Sunday, The Abercorn, Ennis Gillen, Oma. Stories were told in muted tones, the emotion palpable. For some it was a cathartic experience to write their story. For many others who wanted to write, the memory was just too painful. For nurses who have been exposed to more recent atrocities, such as the 1998 OMA bomb, these events are too recent to record. For others, there are some experiences that we may never be told, as the memories are just too horrific to recount. This was particularly evident from nurses who cared for those injured in a bomb explosion at Le Monde House Hotel in 1978 when 12 people were killed and 30 injured. The injuries from this bomb caused extreme burns to all casualties. For many nurses, the smell of burnt meat still evokes horrific memories. Our other observations of these events were how nurses, aware that colleagues could have different cultural, religious or political affiliations, avoided commenting on controversial or sensitive issues. Northern Ireland is a small place which throughout the Troubles had a population of around one and a half million. The nursing workforce was and is reflective of the whole community. What we heard and what is apparent in the accounts received was that all casualties were regarded simply as our patients. We heard comments such as, everyone bleeds the same way, or that the pain of all relatives is the same when confronted with injury or death of a loved one. Low staffing levels was another common comment. Nothing changes, does it? Innovative emergency plans worked and help arrived day or night. The appearance of supporting nursing staff and hospital teams was always voluntary. It's amazing that at the height of the troubles, absenteeism rates were lower than in other parts of the UK. Many stories recount student experiences, such as being caught in crossfire, co confronting injuries so severe that the patients were unrecognisable, witnessing the deaths of people their own age. All of these experiences have left a lasting memory. Many of you will re remember that at this time students were the employees of the hospital training schools and therefore part of the workforce. Having spent a day or night witnessing death or injury caused by bomb blast or bullet, students relied on the camaraderie of colleagues 
to support them through what they had witnessed. There were no counselling service then, yet another frequent remark. As we spoke to colleagues and received their stories, we wondered how we coped, but everyone adapted. Living and working with bombs and bullets became a way of life. As many nurses recounted, we were all in it together. The memories shared relived both the pain of remembering and the pride that effective multidisciplinary teamwork had developed services which were so efficient that they gained worldwide prominence. The book therefore is dedicated to all nurses who worked through this period. The current generation of nurses will continue to care for the troubles related injured and bereaved for many years to come. As those who have been physically and mentally scarred grow older and develop additional complications from their injuries. During this project, some of our committee met severely injured patients they nursed in 1972. These patients who lost limbs in their teenage years, now in later life, for clinical reasons, have had to resort to wheelchair use instead of prosthetics. A past Northern Ireland Nurse of the Year is chief executive of a charity which provides care and support for people affected by the troubles, is now seeing the transgenerational effect on the next generation of the families needing support. This includes nurses. The accounts in the book have been described as raw and brutally honest. As a committee, we find this project sobering, enlightening and challenging. It was sobering to be reminded about events which we had forgotten. How could one forget the paramilitary punishment of tarring and feathering, or the frequency of guns being pointed at nurses, and the gun attacks on patients? Throughout, nurses relied on their professional training, judgment and common sense. Since publication, we have received many positive comments nationally and internationally but I find the comments from nurses most evocative. Last week, a contributor told me that she had wanted to get her story told before she died. Her friend said, I have the book, but I can't open it. The memories are too painful. My children asked me about nursing then, and I can't tell them, but now I can give them the book. And so we hope that our book will stand as a record of how the nursing profession in Northern Ireland served its community throughout these troubled times. Finally, as Peter said, the publication of this book has been made possible by the generous bequest made to the college by Dr. Mona Gray. The committee are grateful for the support and confidence shown to us by Dr. Peter Carter, Janice Smith, Dr. Carolyn Mason, and all the college staff in Windsor Avenue. At times, we seem to be a permanent fixture in the building. Our thanks are also due to the staff of RCNP who have been responsible for the publishing of our book. And without all this support, we would never have been able to achieve our aim. In a moment, we are going to hear two of the stories from the book from contributors Jean Garland and Attractor Bradley. But first, let's have a look at what's in the book.
He was the first black man that I ever touched. Later, I would work as a nurse in Africa for 23 years, but I've often thought back to the night when this British soldier arrived in the recovery ward at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast. He was caught up in a war that made distinctions between Protestant and Catholic, Unionist and Nationalist, but not between black and white. What did this handsome man have to do with our own homegrown conflict? A first year student nurse, I was on night duty in the recovery ward on the 31st of May, 1972. We were not long into our night shift when an enormous explosion rocked the building and rattled the windows. The evenings were still light till late and we were able to look out the recovery ward windows, up, which was up above the main corridor of the hospital. We could see clouds of ominous smoke rising from the Springfield Road Police Station, which was also an army base. Almost immediately, ambulances with sirens blaring rushed out of the hospital gates towards the scene of the explosion. We knew it was going to be another demanding night in the theatres of the Royal and in our recovery ward. And it was a night that this 19 year old student nurse would remember clearly for years to come. He arrived into casualty and was rushed to theatre. From there he was brought to the recovery ward. He is unconscious, the surgeon did not operate we were told by the reporting nurse. He had bad internal injuries and including head injuries. Just make him as comfortable as possible. With this terse report, the nurse in charge asked me to stay with him until he died. A portable screen was put around the bed. I felt helpless. I wanted to do something to help him, but what could I do? Even his name spoke of a different culture and origin of my own. I wondered about his family far away. Did they know he was dying? I remember looking down at his shoulder muscles and strong body still covered with the white coating of dust from the explosion. I filled a basin of warm water and as best as I could without disturbing him, I washed the dust from his face, lashes and curly hair. I cleaned his broad shoulders. I held his strong hand and talked to him as gently I adjusted his pillow. I wanted him to know that he was not alone. Within one hour, he slipped away from this life, still unaware of the 30 pound bomb that had wrecked the police station and cut short his life at 28 years of age. Later, I learned that this handsome black man was a very popular army lightweight boxing champion who had represented Ulster and England. His roots were in the Seychelles he had a wife and four children. I am glad that he was not alone when he died in our war. Coming off night duty was tough that next morning. In contrast to day duty, there were no other nurses available to listen to my personal traumas of the night. I felt like I had grown older overnight. I had been through something that most girls do not have to cope with in a lifetime. But telling my part in this black soldier's story would just have to wait. That's a very difficult story to follow. Um, I'm going to read one of my stories from the book. It's called The Ticking Bag. 
One of the many incidents that stands in my mind during the Troubles happened in that Nagavan Hospital on a sunny evening in the summer of 1973 when I was working as a junior staff nurse in casualty. It was a very busy, as usual, evening and we were dealing with several casualties when there was a loud knock at the door of the examination treatment room. Sister opened it to find a young man who seemed very distraught. I'm sorry to trouble you, but there's a bag in the waiting room and it's ticking. I immediately went to clear the waiting area. A sister phoned to bleep the nursing officer in charge that evening. After a tense few minutes, the call was returned and sister started to explain the situation. To her shock, the nursing officer told sister to take the ticking brown bag out of the waiting area and to leave it outside, in case it was a bomb. What's this, sister? You want me to lift the ticking bag and take it outside? Yes, she was told. Do it now, and I will ring the bomb squad. We both gasped, but as happened in those days, we did as we were told. Sister lifted the bag, I cleared the way, and we walked out of the department. We didn't know where to put it, so we kept walking, as far away from the hospital as possible, over to a nearby grassy area. Sister put the bag down on the grass, and we raced back to Casualty entrance, where I almost ran into a police car. I knocked on the window, and Sister says, Are you here about the ticking bag? No. We hear about a road traffic accident to speak to somebody who was knocked down, replied the policeman. We told him that the man had already been discharged. Then, with a smile on his face, he says, let me hear about this ticking bag. No, I said, you're not the bomb squad. With that, the radio start relaying, started relaying a message, and the second policeman said, we are now. <laughs> the first officer then asked, where is this bag? To which sister replied, it's over there in the middle of that grassy area. He seemed surprised. Who took it over there? Beast his sister. Follow instructions from my nursing officer. To which the officer replied, she obviously doesn't think much of you. <laughs> they both left to check the bag, all the while talking on the radios as we stood our ground in the casualty entrance. A short time later, they gave the all clear and came back to us laughing. The first policeman said, I have been bombarded with many things in my time, including an air bomb, but I've never been attacked with a pound of mints and an alarm clock before. <laughs> we guessed that the wee man that had been knocked down went without his supper that night. Thank you, Jean and Attracta. We have recently heard the good news that BBC Northern Ireland has commissioned an hour-long TV programme inspired by the book. This is a 12-minute taster film. This is a 12-minute taster film of this programme, which incorporates a number of interviews with nurses who contributed stories. I hope you enjoy watching it. I remember first of all the red phone rang and that was a disaster phone. That that rang you knew that something was going to happen. The awfulness of it. And you got so angry inside yourself. What is this about? And the worst was of course if they had limbs, traumatic amputated limbs. And it just was dirt and mess and horrible smell. In the middle of all the mayhem and patients coming in and one ambulance man came up and just handed me a great pile of what looked like dirty laundry and then I just looked down.